Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, April 28th. Our special guest today is Matt Miller. His topic is 10 Things to Ditch in Education and What to Do Instead. Your co-moderators are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. And Paula is going to introduce Matt and ask him the newbie question. Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending <clears throat> on where you're joining us from. I'm so excited that I have the opportunity to introduce our guest today. Matt Miller is a teacher, blogger, and presenter from West Central Indiana. He has infused technology and innovative teaching methods in his classes for more than 10 years. He is the author of two books. Ditch That Textbook, for Your Teaching and Revolutionize Your Classroom, and Ditch That Homework, Practical Strategies to Make Homework Obsolete. He writes at Ditch That Textbook blog about using technology and creative ideas in teaching. He is a Google Certified Innovator, a Skype Master Teacher, and a winner of the WTHI TV Golden Apple Award. Matt has presented to thousands of teachers at hundreds of workshops on a number of topics related to educational technology, world language instruction, and more. I've had the honor of meeting Matt in person at ISTE and love following him on Twitter, through his blog, and his podcast. He combines a conversational, engaging speaking style with loads of resources, leaving teachers equipped and inspired to move forward, which I know he will do for us today. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Matt Miller and ask him to answer our newbie question. So Matt, we are going to, we would like you to start out by telling us why is it important for teachers to not only reflect on their teaching practices, but to seek alternatives to modify or abandon those that aren't working for their students. So get away from that. All right. I am so excited to be with all of you today. And thank you again so much for um, for bringing me on the show. This is the second time that I've done it. I, I was telling uh, everyone before the show started that um, the first time I did this a couple years ago, I was really, really nervous about it. And uh, this time I feel a little more, kind of knowing what I'm doing, I feel a little more at ease about it. So um, super excited to be able to be with all of you today who are giving up part of your Saturday for this. So that that is amazing. So on the newbie question, I kind of see it as two different parts. So let's start with the first part. Why is it important for teachers to not only reflect on their teaching practices as the first? I think it's, that's, that's obviously a really important thing to me. I know it has been through my teaching career because, um, you know, I basically would sometimes get stuck in this rut of continually doing things the way that I had always done and wouldn't take the time to stop and look at what was effective, what wasn't effective, why do I think that it was? You know, it's so easy for us when we get done with a day of teaching or after we're done with a class to just move on to what's next because we have our plates so full. Um, you know, with all the emails and the meetings and the grading and the lesson planning and everything, it's so easy to skip the reflection piece. But I think whenever we do that, our students benefit and we benefit and we're able to improve. And even though it takes some time to do, I think it's it's such an important thing to do. And then the second side of that says, but to seek alternatives to modify or abandon those that aren't working for their students. And see, I think that's been so huge too, is to be willing to take a critical eye to what we're doing. Um, there's, a, there's a phrase, I can't remember, oh, yeah, it's escaped me, of um, who said this, but um, it's a, a practice in writing called Killing Your Darlings. And it's those things that we love, that we've sort of fallen in love with, that we're comfortable with, and that we like, that just maybe aren't getting the results anymore. Um, 
And sometimes in writing, it's things that we think are really great, but we've fallen a little bit too much in love with them. And I think that that's so easy to happen in teaching, too. And so I think that, um, you know, we've got to be willing to do that. And I've found, for me personally, that being on Twitter and trying to avoid the echo chamber mentality on Twitter has been huge for me on this, where I try to... If I see something on Twitter that sort of rubs me the wrong way or that I think that I disagree with, I don't abandon it. I don't block the person that said it. But I try, whenever I can, to look at it and read through the tweets and actually think about it and go, why do I feel the way that I feel? And why did I have that strong reaction to it? And I found that that's been really good for growth and reflection for me, too. So just being willing to you know, to, to hear other people, just because somebody has a different opinion doesn't mean that we have to dismiss them completely, and it doesn't mean that we can't have civil dialogue. I think we've, in, in many ways, we've sort of degraded on that to the point where if somebody doesn't agree with you, sometimes it's so easy to either get mad at them or to totally dismiss them. But I think we've got to listen to each other and learn from each other in that way. So, anyway... I hope I didn't take too long to answer that newbie question, but that was one that, that hit near and dear to my heart, so I definitely wanted to touch on that. So uh, if you're just joining us, welcome so much uh, to the show today. We're going to be talking 10 things to ditch in education. Um, I'm Matt Miller. I've written the book, Ditch That Textbook. Uh, I keep the blog, Ditch That Textbook, also, and do presentations on a variety of things related to uh, ditching textbooks. And so if you look at this title, yeah, if you look at this title, 10 Things to Ditch in Education, I know sometimes people are going, wait a second, you want us to ditch 10 things? <laughs> and I know even when, when I suggested this title, one of the first things that came to mind for me is if somebody sees that title, they're going to go, but if I've got to ditch everything, what am I going to do? You know, what, what am I actually going to use if I ditch everything? And so when I use this title, uh, you know, 10 things to ditch in education. I'm not suggesting that we have to totally throw all of the things out that we've been using in the classroom. Um, anything that is traditional in nature, we don't have to totally throw it out. But I think, kind of like what I was saying earlier, that we need to be willing to take that critical eye to what we do and to think, is this still meeting the needs of all of our students? And could this be done better? And is there something maybe that's come along either in technology or in new research or in some of the anecdotes from the, um, the teachers that we interact with? Is there something out there that can affect our practice? And I think we've got to be willing to do that. And that's kind of what this is all about because obviously, you know, we hear from education speakers and bloggers and writers and everything about how the world is changing. And we know that it is. You know, um, technology is a big part of our lives these days. Um, cell phones, can you, can you remember what life was like before you had a smartphone or before you had a cell phone? I stop every once in a while and try to remember what that life was like, and I have such a hard time remembering what it was like before I could Google something on demand, or I could listen to a podcast, or I could check social media in my pocket. Um, so, you know, th that's the, li the world that obviously our students are living in, and that's just the beginning of all of the changes. And we're starting to see with augmented reality and virtual reality, um, you know, starting to enter into the classroom. Artificial intelligence is going to automate some things that we used to have to do ourselves that can end up saving us some time. We've got our smart devices and so on and so forth. So um, that's really what this is all about is giving you some, some things to think about that maybe you might want to ditch. Maybe you'll, you'll hear about it or you'll think about it and you go, yeah, maybe it's time to change that. So that's kind of what this is, this is all about today. So like I said, you definitely don't have to ditch everything, and that's not really what I'm even suggesting here. So, so let's start to dig into this a little bit. Oh, and I realized that I had all these nice little slides here. See what I was just talking about? Now there it is in visuals. <laughs> let's dive right into this first one, shall we? So the first one is ditch that textbook. Um, and this is something that I did a while back, and it wasn't because textbooks are evil or because I think that you know, we need to throw all of the textbooks into the nearest dumpster, you know, with a resounding thud. 
Although if you decide to do that, definitely get it on video and shoot me a link to it because I kind of like to watch it, you know. <laughs> but um, for me, uh, ditching that textbook was the, the beginning to a big journey to becoming more relevant to my students. And so what happened was I started out my teaching career the first three or four years or so, and I was very, very, very traditional, you know teach from the textbook, work my way through the chapters, do the discussion questions at the end, worksheets, workbook pages, I mean, the whole nine yards. That's what had been done to me. That's what I was familiar with. It was easy for me to do that, and a lot of other teachers around me were doing it. So that's what I did for the first three or four years. And I started looking around and thinking about what... I was doing and how the, the kind of reactions that students had to it and the effectiveness that it was having. And so there, you know, there I was at the beginning, at the front of the class teaching very traditionally, and I started to realize this really isn't working. And I wanted in my high school Spanish classes, I really wanted my students to be fluent in the language and to be able to speak it and to be able to actually use it and not just study it as an academic subject. And I started to realize that my textbook was becoming a crutch. See, what I mean by that is whenever I was uncomfortable with what I was teaching or if I was unsure of myself or if I just didn't have enough time, then I would lean on that textbook and I would just start doing activities out of it. Or I, sometimes I just didn't think outside of it. And I started to realize that it was a sort of like a hurdle or a stumbling block that was, was in front of my students' ability to use that language the way that I really wanted them to. And so I started slowly ditching um, my textbook little by little, uh, you know, not using it as much. I think because I wasn't getting the results out of it until one day eventually, and it kind of happened in the middle of class. I don't recommend this, by the way, but this is what happened to me. I'm in the middle of a class. I'm teaching so traditionally. Um, I'm actually up at the podium uh, giving discussion questions or even kind of like the end of the chapter questions to my students from the podium. And I'm looking out, and they're so bored, and they're so disconnected. And I just stopped in the middle of that session, and I go, everybody grab your textbooks. He had been kind of like boiling down inside of me very slowly for a while. And then it came to this point where I just couldn't do it anymore. And so there we went to the back of the room and we put our textbooks up. And I kind of quit them cold turkey. Um, but that was after I had sort of come to that point little by little. And um, after that, it was more of let's create what my students need to get to the desired goals that we have. And so um, that's, that's kind of the, the route that I went. And it really became kind of like an opportunity to blast off into a new adventure. It wasn't easy. I mean, it would have been so much easier for me to let my, you know, the photocopier create my lessons instead of myself. But that's what I needed to do. And um, so that, that was kind of the beginning of this whole thing. So, um, you know, whatever it is for you, that you need to break yourself out of that rut. Because I, I was pretty close to leaving the teaching profession. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. And um, that's what I needed to break myself out of that rut. And so hopefully, hopefully you're not in that same rut that I definitely was. So that's number one, to ditch that textbook. Number two is to ditch that lecture. And I know a lot of teachers that have. Um, now, I won't say that lectures all are, are totally 100% ineffective and horrible. In fact, what I'm doing right now could be considered a digital version of a lecture. Um, and I would say if there are good storytelling elements of it and if it's engaging, you can still definitely get something, um, you still get something out of it. But leaning on that lecture too much can be a real pain because what happens? You know, so often we get up in front of the classroom and we've got our slides, we've got our bullet points. You guys have probably um, dealt with this before, right? Where um, you go to a meeting and someone is just like reading their bullet points off of the screen. And then there's another slide. There's more bullet points and they're just reading it until eventually it starts to feel like this, right? <laughs> it's like, there's all of these bullet points. And I could have just read your slides instead of listening to you. 
And um, I saw this this um, example of what somebody in the business world has done to defeat this. And I think this has great, great connections to teaching. So I don't know if you recognize this guy. This is Jeff Bezos, which is the, uh, I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing his name right, but he's the, he's the CEO of Amazon. And recently there was this, this was article that was published that said that in the meetings in, at Amazon, in some of the meetings, they have outlawed PowerPoint or slide presentations altogether. Because he says, you know, they're just, they're just not an effective way of getting things across. In fact, um, well, I'll get to that point in a second. So anyway, what they've done instead is they've switched from PowerPoint presentations, point by point, bullet points on the screen to narrative, storytelling. I've seen the word storytelling. I'm having a hard time keeping up with the chat. I'm just going to let you know. I won't see very much of it. But every once in a while, I glance over there. And I've seen the word storytelling a couple of times. And that's exactly what they're doing at Amazon instead, is instead of giving the point-by-point -point explanation, they write it out in story. Because pretty much everything has a story, you know? And so that's, that's what they're doing instead, and it's making their meetings shorter, and it's actually having more impact. And so I think if we can get connected to the story of whatever it is that we're teaching, because everything has a story, doesn't it? You don't have to be teaching a novel in English, although there is definitely a story there. History is full of stories. Math. I mean, the reason that math exists is because it's useful out in the real world, and there are all sorts of reasons and rationale behind using math. Science. I mean, you just go into everything, and there is a story behind everything. So what if we take a little bit of time and we try to figure out what is the story that this content can tell. Of course, like what's the moral to that story and everything. Um, and so if, we're if we take the time to do that, it makes that emotional impact on students and they can finally kind of like make meaning of why that is supposed to exist in, their, in the real world. Another reason for using story. This is by Carmine Gallo, who wrote a book called Talk Like Ted, which I love. And he says it's well known among neuroscientists that we recall things much better when we see pictures of the object or topic than, we read, than when we read text on a slide. Uh, okay, so that's, that's a little bit different topic. That's the other, the other side of the lecture. So to kind of switch topics away from the storytelling side of it to the images side of it. There are such great brain benefits in using images whenever we talk and whenever uh, we learn. And I think sometimes in education, we kind of look at images as unnecessary um, or kind of like kid stuff, like child's play. But when our brain thinks in images, then that's going to be so powerful in helping us learn. So that can come in the form of drawing little diagrams and stick figures and stuff on the board or adding them to our print materials. So think about that for a second. You know, ask yourself that question. How can you add images to what it is that you're already doing to have more impact? So that could be on handouts that you give students. It could be on slides that you put up. It could be all around the room. It could be in your instruction. Yeah, the, just think about that. Ask yourself that question. You know, for me, this is one big way that I incorporate images together with text, and that's sketch noting. I love sketch noting. It's one of my one of my passions, one of my favorite hobbies. I don't get as much time to do it in, uh, these days as I as I have in the past, and I, I really miss it. And sketching. See, the great thing about it is it does incorporate those visuals. And if you look at my my sketch note that I put up here on the screen. I think that pretty well goes to show you that you don't have to be a fantastic artist to create, to create visual notes like this. Because what have I got? I've got a little stick figure down at the bottom, a, more like a blocky person figure on the right that's in yellow. And then the rest of it is just little doodles. You know, there's a t-shirt. There's a book over on the left. I mean, you guys could draw just about any of that. And even if you're not much of an artist, the great thing about sketch notes is that they're not about art. They're about ideas. So if you can get an idea across in a simple shape or a stick figure or a little 
drawing that isn't even very good, it still gets those same brain benefits. So that, those are a couple of ways I think that we can ditch that lecture, is by focusing on those images and also incorporating some, some storytelling. So maybe, maybe you think about where storytelling and images can fit into your instruction. Number three, ditch that quiet classroom. See, I've been the guilty party on the end of this, and I've had some serious guilt and shame. And the guilt is real, and the shame is real, isn't it? Don't, you guys know what I'm talking about, don't you? Where you've got the noisy class, and they, you know that they're doing, they're doing the great learning. They're doing the things that you want your students to be doing. But the other classes around you, you know, you're, you're getting the side eye in the hallway from the other teachers. And, you know, the, the quiet classroom doesn't fit the mold of what we've had for so long. And so I think that there are a couple of ways that we can ditch that quiet classroom to be able to, to, to get that engagement and really be able to hear from, from everybody. Um, you know, there was a quote recently from... Um, I, I heard this from Holly Clark. Uh, Holly Clark has written the book called The Google Infused Classroom, and uh, I had her on a presentation at my uh, online Ditch That Textbook Digital Summit, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. And she said something that has stuck with me. And she, she just said it off the top of her head. I think there's a lot more nuance to it, and she agreed with that. But um, I want to say it here just to, to get that same idea across, and that is that these days, with the technology options that we have in front of us, she said, and then try to, try to envision what she's really trying to mean when she said this. She said, if, you, if you're not hearing from every student in the class, then you're doing it wrong. Now, that's kind of a black and white, uh, black and white statement, and she even agreed to that. And so what I think she really means from that is that we have more opportunities now to hear from every student and not just depend on the class discussion where you say, uh, who has something to add, raise your hand. Like, how many kids actually raise their hand when they do that? <laughs> when, you're, when you're in professional development, how many adults actually raise their hand when they do that? Not very many, right? And so now we have the opportunity to hear from pretty much everybody by giving them these, these great response tools. And we're able to give students a voice unlike we have before and to let them basically be able to, to speak. And one of my favorite tools to do that, of course, is Flipgrid. Um, Flipgrid is kind of all over the place these days. Um, I haven't seen a digital tool take off in the education world quite like Flipgrid. I'd say Kahoot maybe was kind of along the same lines, but Flipgrid has kind of taken the education world by storm in some ways, I think. Um, and obviously Flipgrid allows students to respond to a question or a prompt from the teacher by recording short videos. And the ability to do that, to be able to see and hear students, is great for the teacher, but it's also great for the students to be able to hear each other. And so you know, this is another one of those ways where we ditch the quiet classroom. We let kids actually talk, you know. Um, how often do we walk by classrooms in our schools and we walk by and we see kids sitting quietly at desks working on papers? And that's not to say that writing isn't important and that individual quiet reflection isn't important because it is. But if that's all that we're doing, we're missing out, you know? So I think Flipgrid has great potential on that. Um, I know there are tons of uh, implementation ideas over on the Flipgrid blog if you go to flipgrid.com. In fact, in the... Uh, in the notes for this presentation, I've got a couple of links to some places where you can find some great Flipgrid ideas. I know that Carly Mora is in the house in this presentation right now, and she wrote a great guest blog post for me that was also posted on her blog um, called Catch Flipgrid Fever, 15 plus ways to use Flipgrid in the classroom. That's just one of many, many resources that are out there. And if you want to check out the, uh, the paid uh, Flipgrid classroom, option which gives students the ability to do video replies to each other. I've got a code here that you can use to upgrade. So just use my name, Matt Miller. I don't get anything. Uh, just Flipgrid has given me this code that I can give out to all of you to use for free. So, Because we love free, don't we? 
<laughs> free is our favorite price as teachers. So Flipgrid is a great one. Now, whenever we have students use their voice and speak like this, um, I think a common mistake that we make is that we tell them, okay, now just go record a response. And we don't actually give them some, we don't give them the guidance on how to do that verbal communication. And we know how important the verbal communication skills are and are going to be in the workforce. I mean, if you look at the, the job skills reports from employers on what they're looking for from those that they hire, you know, those oral communication skills are so huge. And so what can we do to help kids do that better? I mean, if we wanted them to write a report, we wouldn't just say, okay, go write something and turn it in. We're going to give them some specific coaching on how to do that. So how can we do that ourselves? This is one of my favorite models that I've come across. So this is the PV legs model from Eric Palmer. He wrote about this in his book, Well Spoken. And you can find more information about this at pvlegs.com. These are six things that we can encourage students to do with their voice to improve their ability to communicate orally. So it's like the, the poise. How well, do they, how well do they remain composed? How do they use their voice? Does their voice have life in it? Are they making eye contact with their audience? Are they gesturing appropriately? Are they talking too fast or too slow? And so all of those things. See, if we, if we give students an opportunity to speak, especially on something like Flipgrid, then if we even just give them one of these, I'd say don't, I would even encourage, encourage you not to say, okay, we're going we're gonna to try to do all six of these, or even trying to grade someone on a rubric right away and say, you need to do all six of these. I'd say pick one. Pick one out and encourage them to work on it. Okay, this time I want to make sure that your voice has life in it. So make sure that you think about that while you're recording. Because really, if you're trying to answer the question and try to have poise and try to give good gestures and try to monitor your speed and try to give life, all at the same time, that's a lot. So just think about one of those, I think, and that can be huge. Speaking of voice, since the, the ditch that quiet classroom idea was kind of a, a, a gentle nod towards uh, giving students voice, this is one of my, yes, West, exactly, like trying to improve a golf swing, which has been a challenge throughout my life. <laughs> See, I told you I'd get over to the chat every once in a while. That word golf just popped off the screen to me. <laughs> so, um, so speaking about the, the student voice, you know, video isn't the only way to do it because we also have the ability to communicate in audio. And audio is growing by leaps and bounds, um, you know, especially with podcasts. You know, you've got podcasts, which I'm going to talk about here in a second, but also with our smart speakers that we have all over the place. You know, we have Siri and Google and Alexa and all of that. Um, but there's a lot that we're doing with voice these days. And which is funny because um, doing things with our voice has been around for a while. But um, you know, the, the statistics show that podcasts have been growing steadily for many, many years. And the great thing about them is that you can learn by listening, which is different from video, different from reading. Because if you do video or reading, if you're consuming content in that way, you have to give your whole entire being to that. If you're listening, obviously you can do other things. We've been doing that with radios in our cars for decades. And so for me, I listen to podcasts about education and about a variety of other topics so that I can learn on the go. So like when I'm cutting the grass, which actually I'm getting ready to do this afternoon because my grass is finally growing, finally. Spring is finally here in Indiana, sorry. Um, but that's, that's what I do um, with podcasts is I will listen while I do other things, while I go on a run or, you know, just a, just a variety of different things. So um, Anchor is a great tool that lets you create these podcasts totally for free. And this is a neat thing that I think we can incorporate in the classroom very easily because what we can do is record little clips of what students are learning publish them to an episode on our podcast through the Anchor app, and all of a sudden, 
our students' work has this great audience that we can share to. And so if we created, I mean, just think about it. If you took a little bit of time every once in a while and had students reflect in audio about what they're learning and then publish it onto a podcast, then we're able to share that podcast with parents, with grandparents, with relatives that don't live nearby, uh, other classes of the same age. You might be surprised at the audience that your students are able to create through doing something like that. Uh, and again, there is a post, I think Peggy may have just, yep, Peggy just dropped it into the chat. There's a post on our resources page that I've written about why your students need a podcast and how to do it fast and free. So if you haven't checked that out, that might be something worth, worth looking into. So there's the, there's the um, step by step there. You set up a class podcast on Anchor, which is super easy. Record clips all throughout the week of students either reflecting on what they've learned or just sharing what they've learned. Organize them into an episode on Friday, publish to the world, and then let people know that it's out there. And again, you might be surprised at who ends up listening. So I think there's lots of ways that we can ditch that quiet classroom and move forward. Ditch that traditional PD. Because we've all probably done this before. We've all shown up as a big group and sat down in the conference room and sat and listened to somebody for an hour. I've done it so many times, and I can't tell you how many times I've walked away from them and gone, how am I supposed to use this in my classroom again? You know, it, it, it happens, doesn't it? And we don't have to get professional development that way. I think if your main source of professional development is school-provided, large group professional development, you are missing the boat these days because the personalized PD, the, the, the PD on demand, the things that we can learn by seeking out what we want to learn is so much stronger and so much more powerful than just the sit and get. And so I want to tell you one little thing that I've done recently that you may want to check out. This is what I alluded to earlier, the Ditch That Textbook Digital Summit. This is a free online conference that I do for teachers. I've done it for the last two Decembers. I have plans to continue doing it indefinitely. <laughs> I, it's, been, it's been such a hit that I don't, I don't want to stop it. So um, like it says here, a free online conference for educators. And what we do is we have nine presentations. There may be 45 minutes to an hour long where I get some of my favorite presenters, some of the best presenters that I can find and have them do a free presentation for you. You listen to them during December and you can get free professional development credit, like free um, completion, uh, certificates of completion. <laughs> it's part of the uh, early questions. If you were one of the early arrivers, we had a question about this. So um, it happens in December. If you want to check it out, it's at ditchsummit.com. And in fact, from there, you can sign up for the email notifications. So whenever it starts to get close in November and early December, I start sending you emails saying, hey, you don't want to miss this. So um, definitely go check that out if you'd like to. So uh, yeah, traditional professional development. This is just one little snippet of how we can dump that on its head, so to speak. Oh, we're going to get to an interesting topic now. Uh, so this is the title of a book that I co-wrote with Alice Keeler. Let me go back a minute for a second. Called Ditch That Homework. And we talk about our own experiences with homework and provide some alternatives so that if you want to reduce your reliance on homework so that you don't depend on it so much, we have a bunch of strategies to offer. And one of the key questions in this book is this. How much return do you get on your homework? And again, we talked about that critical eye early. And so I think if you turn a critical eye to your homework, this is part of the, this is part of the question that you got to ask yourself is how much return, I think of it as almost like an investment, like we're investing money. And if you're a good investor, you want to put your money down someplace where you're going to get a return on that investment. And I started looking at homework, and I'm going, we spend so much time doing it, assigning it, grading it, fielding complaints and questions about it. And when we have students go outside of the classroom to do it, we lose control of so many different variables. And I started to, started to think, how much return am I getting on all of that time investment? 
And I started to realize that personally, I wasn't getting near as much as I thought I needed to. And so instead of trying to, and I tried all sorts of stuff, creative homework, choice homework, uh, you know, just all sorts of varieties, and I never was able to get the return on it. And so I started to look at this question myself. What would class look like without homework? Have you ever asked yourself that before? What would it look like if you didn't have homework? And what I started to realize was that when I quit assigning as much homework, the conversations in my classroom changed. Instead of having the conversations about where's your homework, why didn't you do your homework, when am I going to get it, I'm missing this, I'm missing that, or you need to turn your homework in. Instead of having all of those conversations, we started having more conversations about, brace yourself for this, Spanish, which is what I was teaching. We started talking about the content more and less about the administrative details of homework. And that had a huge impact on my class. And I'd say whenever you put all of that together and you factor in the equity issues, because you know kids don't go home to the exact same positive learning environments that we hope for. When you throw in the fighting and the relationship piece with the families and everything, I'm just, I'm just personally less and less convinced that kids are better for having done it. So anyway, that's my big, my big pitch to, not, I know the, the book just popped up when I said my big pitch. You don't have to buy the book, but I hope that you do at least think about um, your, your use of homework and are there ways that it can be done that you can do things without as much or without it at all, honestly. Um, so anyway, that's, that's that right there. <laughs> we're going to jump into ditch that geekiness in a second, but since we're, we're through five and we've got ten, and I know I've got to hustle through these last ones, since we're kind of at the midpoint for the numbers, and we will get this, get this done on time, I promise. I've kind of got it set up this way. I want you to take just a second and stretch. If you're like me, you've been sitting here for, actually, I'm standing up. I've got one of those crazy standing desks, which I absolutely love. Anybody else would love to see in the, in the notes if you, um, or the chat, if, if you do a standing desk. I love my standing desk, so I've been standing up this whole time. But if you haven't, stretch, maybe stand up. I'm reading this great book called Win by Daniel Pink, and he talks about the science behind the timing of things that we do. And he says, he's got this, this technique. He says that, he, it's called the 20-20-20 rule. He says that if you'll take 20 seconds to look at something that is 20 feet away from you, that's only two 20s, I can't remember the third one. But basically, that's supposed to kind of like refocus you quickly. Or get some chocolate and coffee beans. I totally like that too, Catherine, that's good. So. Anyway, okay, hopefully you've gotten that stretch break and you're good. Hopefully you didn't, like, take off because I suggested that you stretch. Have you ever seen that before? Sometimes you're like, okay, talk amongst yourselves. I do this in professional development, and all of a sudden four people stand up and walk out. And I'm like, no, that's not what this was for. So anyway, let's move on to number six. Number six is ditch that geekiness. Before I get to that slide, um, when we talk about using technology in the classroom, and I'm like this too, so don't, don't think any different. Um, sometimes it seems like when we hear people talking about technology in the classroom, it's like, it feels like you have to be an expert at everything to feel worthy of using it or to feel like you know what you're doing. Um, I've gotten the flashy thing syndrome that Leslie Fisher talks about. I've heard in her presentations, she, she calls it something like that flashy thing syndrome where it's like there's a new little digital tool and you're like, ooh, I need to go check that out. I need to use that in my classroom. And then there's all of this stuff. And you hear some people use it at a super high level. And all of a sudden, um, all of a sudden with those, with all of those things, you start to go, man, I just, I can't keep up with all of this. And I saw this quote that I absolutely, absolutely love. This is from David Guerin, who is a, an administrator down in Alabama. And he says, we don't need tech geeks who will teach. Because it feels like sometimes that's what's being demanded of us, doesn't it? We don't need tech geeks who will teach. You know what we need is we need teaching geeks who will tech. Doesn't that put you at ease a little bit? 
I know even for me, I feel like I'm pretty with it with technology, but there's a lot of times where I realize that I don't have the same level of knowledge as other people do. But if you can find that one little piece that moves the needle for learning in your classroom, that's huge. And so it doesn't have to be geeky. You don't have to use all of the tools. If you can find that one thing that makes the difference in learning for you and your kids, you're golden. That's, that's what we really need. We don't have to learn all of it. We don't have to get overwhelmed with it if we can find that one thing. So that's that one little piece of encouragement for you there. By the way, I think uh, Peggy has thrown a link in about this. Um, if you're looking for more ideas of how to use, and it's funny because I just talked about find one thing, and now I'm giving you 101 things. That's kind of, I didn't realize I was doing that. Oh, well, that's okay. If you're looking for some new ideas, I do have something for you. It's a free ebook called 101 Practical Ways to Ditch That Textbook. There it is. Thank you, Peggy. You can go to ditchthattextbook.com slash 101. In fact, this is just recently updated within the last month or two with all new content. So if you're looking for more ideas, you can get that. Um, this will also sign you up for my email newsletters, which come out every week with more practical tips and ideas that you can use in your classroom. Let's get through these last four, shall we? Ditch that studying, which sounds crazy. But here's what I mean by that. I don't mean don't study. But I mean maybe study a different way. Because how we have, um, how we have studied in the past is not necessarily the most effective based on cognitive science, on brain research, on all of that. And so the way that we've we ask kids to study so often is, read over the notes, go back over the chapter, come take the test or quiz. But what brain science tells us is that the information's flowing in the wrong direction if you do that. It's going into your brain, but really what you should do is you should try to retrieve information out of your brain to study. This is called retrieval practice. And so if you can study by putting things down and asking yourself, can I restate what I just learned in my own words? Can I do a brain dump and jot down everything that I've learned recently? That's, that's kind of the idea behind retrieval practice. And it has much, much better, um, much better long-term memory benefits than trying to do it the other way. And in fact, one place where retrieval practice has been at work in your life for a long time is music. And so what happens is if you're listening to the radio and you try to sing along with the lyrics, because do you do that too? Because I'm definitely a, an in-the-car singer. Um, even if I don't know the lyrics, as I'm trying to sing those lyrics, you know what I'm doing. I'm retrieving them from my mind. So if you've ever had lyrics to a song stuck in your head and you're going, why can I remember those songs from the, the why can I remember those crazy 80s songs, but I can't remember this person's name or I can't remember this list of things? It's because you've been using retrieval practice for all this time. This is one of my favorite resources for doing retrieval practice at retrievalpractice.org. Um, and so they have tons of great resources and ideas for um, using retrieval practice in the classroom for the K-12 to and even the university level. So definitely go check that out. Ditch that isolation is number eight. And so the idea behind this is that if you're like me, it's so easy to get stuck in your own classroom, in your own castle, behind your own stone walls and your moat and your drawbridge, and to block everybody else out. And it actually led me to almost leave the teaching profession. See, about four or five or six years into my teaching career, I was coaching high school Spanish. No, oh, did I just say that? Let me start that over. I was coaching high school swimming. I was teaching high school Spanish. There, that's better. And I was literally isolated all the time. I was the entire world languages department. There weren't any other foreign language teachers in my building. And I felt so isolated and I was about ready to leave teaching. And that's about the time that I got connected on Twitter. And I'm sure that if you've listened to this show for very long, you've probably heard tons of people talk about how important Twitter is. But it is a huge part of my story because I got connected to other educators on Twitter at a conference and then started to realize that it was this ever-flowing stream of ideas all the time. And I really believe that the people I met there and the connections and the ideas that I got there totally, totally saved my career. And so maybe, if you haven't already, maybe find your tribe. Find your teacher tribe. Those people that are 
focused on and interested in the same things that you're interested in. Or like I said earlier, maybe find some people that rub you a little bit the wrong way and figure out why you feel the way that you do about them. And these tribes are all over the place. In fact, speaking of tribe, <laughs> this is this is a tribe that um, is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I run a podcast called the Google Teacher Tribe Podcast uh, with Casey Bell of the Shake Up Learning blog, uh, another one of my favorites. And every week we put out this podcast about using Google in the classroom. But there has been a tribe that has come out of this on social media. We have the GT Tribe hashtag. And people have started to, to flock to that and share ideas and everything. And so that's been huge. And even the Ditch Book Twitter hashtag has become a tribe of mine. So we, we sort of nickname it the Ditch Fam instead of just Ditch Book because it really does feel like a family. There's so many people that come back to it and share ideas with each other. We've got several people in the audience right now that are uh, – ditch book regulars. So um, yeah, so, so it's, that's been another huge part. So whatever your tribe is, I hope that you're able to find it and get connected with it because it's so important. Wait a second. Ditch that tech. Is that crazy? Did I really just say that? Yeah, I really did. Um, I think that especially in some of our education online circles and at some of these technology conferences we go to, sometimes we're made to believe that we need to try to tech up everything that we do. And that's not necessarily the case. Because obviously, and we've, we've all seen it, and we all probably have our stories, where we think that the art of the conversation is slowly dying. Um, where we would rather message people than actually talk face-to-face. -face. And so if we become sort of one-dimensional with the technology, we miss out on that. And I, I also firmly believe in the power of paper. I use paper notes all the time. In fact, my notes for this presentation are written down, written down on paper. Wait a second. Can you hear that? Those are my notes for this presentation on real paper. I love to sketch on paper. I love to take down ideas on paper. Um, tactile things, you know, things that you can use your senses to engage in, breaks us out of that same rut that we get into sometimes with the digital things. So I would encourage you not to get too fixated on the technology, hopefully. And here's the last one. This is one very near and dear to my heart, and I'll try to give you the quick version of this. Safe teaching. See, I've gotten into safe teaching mode so often, especially whenever I feel like I'm starting to rock the boat and I get a little uncomfortable. I'll pull back into safe teaching mode. And for me, I kind of look like that, minus the weird hair on that guy in the icon. Doesn't that kind of look like a leaf? I was looking at that the other day and going, what is that on his head? But, um, you know, being in front of the class and talking and then assigning kids to do, thing, to do things quietly at their seats has been safe teaching for me. And I started to look at that with that critical eye again and realize, you know, Sometimes safe teaching can be risky teaching. We feel like we're playing it safe by doing these things that we've done for so often, for so long. But the reality is, is that sometimes whenever we engage in these practices, they're risky. I look at that direct instruction that I've done and how easy is it for kids to totally flip off the attention switch? I mean, like turn it off completely and quit paying attention to you. Are they learning anything in that? And so what feels safe to us sometimes isn't safe and it can be risky. And so what do we do in light of all that? I don't know about you, but I think we need maverick teachers, you know, the teachers that are willing to try new things, that are willing to buck the status quo and to try to experiment, you know, to create lessons based on who their students are and their needs and their emotional states and their favorite apps and their favorite YouTube channels and all of that stuff, you know, being willing to go out on a limb and try something like that, whether they know it's going to succeed or not. I think uh, that is definitely what our students are begging for, is those maverick teachers. And so my question is, are you one of those maverick teachers? What are you willing to jump in and try? And maybe this presentation has given you some ideas. Maybe some of the discussion in the chat has, because I've seen that it's been fast and furious, and I haven't been able to keep up with it. So I'm glad that somebody is... Um, Somebody's paying attention to that. I'm going to be really interested to see the uh, questions that have come out of all this. So anyway, that's what I have for you. I hope it's been useful to you, and thank you so much for letting me join all of you today on this Saturday. 
Thanks so much, Matt. And yes, I did gather questions. This teacher's been using Flipgrid in his classroom. Any ideas on how to control it in a larger classroom? Or is it better for students to use it outside the classroom? Hmm. I assume we're talking about like the noise level and trying to keep a handle on things. And um, Felipe asked that he may qualify. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll I be would interested. Think that would be it. Yeah, I'll be interested to see in the chat about that um, if anybody has any ideas. I know, um, you know, being giving kids the ability to kind of scatter a little bit. Um, sometimes, if you're able to quietly use the hallway, I know that's dangerous sometimes when there's other classes, but um, just identifying some of those areas where people can kind of pull back is good. And I've also mm -hmm. noticed that if there's a little bit of ambient noise in the background, you're less likely to hear everybody else's voices. Because one of those big issues is, am I going to be first? And if mm -hmm. I'm first to record, then is everybody going to hear what I'm saying? And that happens even with adults, I've found. So if you have some ambient noise, which would be like you know, a little bit of music, um, there's the noisely extension that will give you kind of like um, white noise, so to speak, in the background. Any of those, I think, might help a little bit. OK. Are there content curricula? My copy is jumping. Mm -hmm. Are there content area curricula available for K-12 that focus on storytelling? Curricula that focus on storytelling. Mm -hmm. I assume the question is about if we want to learn more about storytelling as teachers or mm -hmm. if we want to teach storytelling to students. Um, you know, there's... Yeah, for, for specific content areas, science, math, English. Storytelling English in English, obvious, storytelling in science. I, yeah. I think there is. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not familiar with it. But I do know that the general idea of storytelling is all the same. I mean, mm -hmm. and how you, I think, I think we also have to be careful not to try to rely on curricula and resources and all of that to come up with, to pull, to, to do some of those creative things on our own because we know our content, we know our students. And sometimes if we can personalize it to the students and where they are, sometimes we miss out if we use the prepackaged curricula on that. So I'd say mm -hmm. my best advice there is just to, you know, find some of the stuff that's out there. And Peggy says, Wes, you have some great storytelling resources. There you go. I, that's, that's probably a great one. I know Wes is, is well known for his digital storytelling <laughs> stuff. That's an area that he excels in that I don't. So uh, I would definitely check that out too. And this example may, may clarify. So you're saying that instead of just discussing food chains and webs, the fifth graders should write a story about how a day in the life of the top of the food chain might be, or maybe the teacher tells that story, make it like a play. These, I think, were. Sure, and I think that can. Yeah, I think that can be a tool that you can use. I don't think we have to drop everything else and just use that in particular. But mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think that's definitely an engagement tool. And if our brains work that way anyway, then I think that that's you know that's a great tool to use. Okay. That's a great question. What's the best way to get young students started with sketch noting? Hmm. You know what? I think it's a. I think it's more of a challenge to get older students started in sketch noting. But mm. I'd say with young students, you know, young young students are still so wired to do that creative work and to love to draw. Mm -hmm. It's funny. I heard somebody say once. Um, you ask a class full of kindergartners or second graders, who in here is an artist? They'll all raise their hands. You ask middle schoolers or high schoolers, who in here is an artist? And you might get one reluctant hand, or maybe to Ken, Sir Ken Robinson. Thank you, Patty. I thought maybe it was him. Um, but yeah, and so I think with, with young kids, I think if we can show them how the pictures can connect with the words, and I mean, just give them a little bit of guidance, they'll probably run with it a lot easier than the older kids. I think with the older kids, we have to show them that you don't have to be a skilled artist to do great sketch notes that have great brain benefits. Okay. 
And I think this question goes along with um, Anchor. If okay. we record a segment on an iPhone, iPad, can we then put it into an episode working with the desktop version? The students want to interview the art teacher, but we've only used Anchor on the desktop so far. Uh, can you mix okay. formats? Yes. Um, the, the way I understand that question, I think that's a yes. I do a lot of going back and forth between the desktop version and my mobile device. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of my recording on the mobile device, and then once it's done, it uploads it to my Anchor account, and then sometimes I will put my episodes together on the desktop. So yes, you okay. should be able to bounce back and forth pretty readily on that. Okay. Are the Ditch Summit presentations archived? Yes. Now, here's the catch with that. All of the presentations from the, the Ditch Summit are available during the Ditch Summit. Mm -hmm. So what that means is during December, for about two weeks or so, um, that's when the new presentations are released, and that's where I also open up all of the previous presentations. So the only time that you can watch them is, I think of it kind of like an, an in-person conference, where when you're at the conference, that's where the presenters are, that's where all of the attendees are, that's where everything is, and then when everybody goes home, everybody goes home. And so they are, they're sitting there waiting for you, and then whenever the summit comes around, then you'll be able to watch any of those that you want to. Okay. Do you create your own art for your books or outsource that from someone? Ooh, that's a good question. I do a, in um, Ditch That Textbook, there are little sketches at the beginning of each chapter. I did those on my iPad using the paper app. Um, mm -hmm. And then other than that, there's a great graphic artist named Genesis Kohler that did my book, um, Ditch That Textbook. She did Ditch That Homework. And she's done a lot of, if you're familiar with the Dave Burgess Consulting books, she is the mastermind behind the beautiful covers of most of those books. And she's done both of mine. She actually designed the Google Teacher Tribe logo also. So a lot of that art, I just turned that over into the capable hands of her. OK. What about if someone flips the classroom? Would that be considered homework? Yeah. Well, I guess it depends on what your definition of homework is. Um, if you, so you know that there, I mean, I could I could give you an answer to that based on mine. I think I I think anything that's done that's imposed by a teacher to be done outside of class would be considered homework. And mm -hmm. of course, some of those same things I was talking about, some of the equity issues, um, the la the loss of the control on some of those variables, the cheating, the, you know, there's so many of those things that happen, whether it's a flipped classroom. The technology doesn't, isn't the silver bullet that makes it better. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of those same concerns still exist. So I guess the big question is, are you willing to go through all of that stuff, and is it still worthwhile for you to do it? OK. This, I think, is for a lot of people, if I'm already signed up for, for your email, ah. how do I get a copy of the new version of 101? I am typing a, I'm typing an email address. I just did. If you email hello at ditchthattextbook.com and mm -hmm. um, that's, that's to my, uh, that's to Danielle who's on my uh, Ditch That Textbook team and okay. she will shoot you a link to that if you are already uh, signed up. So. Yeah, that's a Great. common common one. That is one little glitch in my system, is if you're already signed up and you want to get it again, I don't have an easy way to do that. So mm -hmm. um, I'll warn Danielle that she may get a flood of emails, but go ahead and email it to her anyway. Okay. <laughs> go ahead and do it. Thank you. Yeah. Do you like sketch noting with an iPad? And if so, what is your favorite sketch noting app now? Ah, OK. Um, yes, sketching on the iPad was my gateway into sketchnoting. I still use the paper app by 53. It's still my favorite. Um, it's just what's, it's like a comfortable pair of shoes for me. You know, it's, the, it's just what I've always used. Um, however, I know some people really love the Procreate app, which is not free but is great. I know the Adobe Draw app is really, really good as well. There's just lots of them that you can use. But honestly, these days, I've started to switch more over to paper, like real paper, you know, that you make out of trees, you know, that kind of paper. 
um, <laughs> I've started using that and some um, some little fine point colored markers or pins or whatever, and that's that's my favorite medium for sketching right now, actually. Okay. Those were the questions that I was able to capture. Great. If anyone else has any others, please type them in chat. And of course, if they want uh, something quick, they can always hit me up on Twitter at jmattmiller, and then I'll put my email address into the chat. It's just matt at ditchthattextbook.com. If it's a little bit longer question, they can always just email me there if they want something personal. Terrific. Thanks again so much, Matt. Of course. And My pleasure. I'm going to turn the show over to Peggy, who will tell us what's coming up next. Well, thank you, Matt. Wow. You have given us so many things to think about. And you're so right. We have to narrow it down. We have to keep it simple and start by picking one thing. This has just been great. And I can't wait to go back and re-listen to it so I can get those suggestions one at a time. So thank you so much for sharing with us today. My pleasure. I'm looking forward to some other great shows coming up next Saturday. Sarah Malchow, I always stumble over her name, Sarah Malchow, is going to be doing a great show on online experiences for global collaboration. And then we're not quite confirmed for May 12th, but May 19th, Randy Ramirez is going to do a presentation on creating the perfect BLT, Balanced Literacy and Technology. And her presentation is awesome. I know you won't want to miss that. And then we'll take a day off for Memorial Day weekend. So put us on your calendar. Join us live whenever you can. And if you can't join us live, be sure to check out the archives. There are so many awesome presentations there that I know you'll enjoy listening to and watching. You can even do that over the summer. And you can get a PD certificate even if you watch a recording. Just complete that survey. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar, where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate session like this one. And as long as it's open to the public, it is free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this site or from within the Live Binder. You can nominate yourself for a featured teacher for, the, for the, a month. The video collection of archives is available on iTunes U and YouTube. As you exit the session, the survey link should open up in your browser, or you can take the link from within the chat or from within the Live Finder. And at the bottom of the survey, you can request a professional development certificate. And it now prints out with your name. Uh, thanks to Patty Ruffing for not only getting these out, uh, but also for an introduction to Collaborate that's in the Live Finder. Oh, also with those, please make sure you use a personal email address. To request these, schools tend to block these from getting to you. Special thanks again to our special guest, Matt Miller, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>